Hello, I'm Sue Cochran, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. The summer and fall salmon fishing season is now underway. As we look at the projections, this year your chances of putting fresh salmon on the table are as good as last year. There should be good numbers of fish, or the abundance of both coho and chinook is pretty good this year. Our quotas aren't quite as high as they were last year, but they're pretty darn close. And the quotas are actually higher than our actual catch from last summer. So we should have a good year out here on the coast. Um, inside we should also have some pretty good fishing in there. In fact, Area 11's been kicking out a number of nice fish already. It was about 10 years ago that we didn't even have a coho season here off the coast of Washington. Our coho numbers were really low and, and we didn't have any way of protecting those with just an open fishery. So the past uh, 10 years or so we've worked real hard to do what we call mass marking of hatchery fish. We clip the adipose fins um, on both coho and chinook and that allows us to open up fisheries in certain areas targeting those hatchery fish which are abundant and healthy and at the same time by releasing the, the unmarked fish or the, the wild fish we can protect those runs that are still at low abundance or still at low levels and it's just a real neat opportunity to be able to target on those hatchery fish and at the same time protect those ESA listed fish or other fish that are just uh, in trouble right now. So when we have these selective fisheries, we have a pretty low impact on wild fish that we're releasing. Our mortality rates are generally less than 10 percent, but we need anglers to really help us out and ensure that we keep those mortality rates low. And in fact, if we could uh, improve the way that we handle fish, and lower those mortality rates, that'll increase our fishing opportunities in the future. So some ways that people can help are by not netting fish, try to release the fish using a, what we call a de-hooker. Um, if the fish has swallowed the, your lure or your, uh, your hooks, just cut the line and let it swim away. Um, try not to bring the fish into the boat if you can. In fact, inside Puget Sound right now, there are new regulations that essentially prohibit you from bringing them in the boat. Um, if you're going to release them. But generally try to play the fish, fish as quickly as you can, get it to the boat quickly so it's not tired. So even though it's summertime and the weather is beautiful, it, it's still a, a big chunk of water out here whether you're on the ocean or in Puget Sound and that water can get real nasty in a hurry. So we need our, our anglers to be safe on the water, make sure they have all of their Coast Guard requirements, wear your life jacket, um, Make sure people know where you are, have a VHF radio. Pay attention to the weather, and when the weather gets bad, get in or don't go out so far that you can't get in safely. But be sure you live to fish another day. A lot of individuals have wondered how we could have uh, good fishing opportunities in 2004 with uh, all the challenges that we face with things like endangered species. And uh, simply what the department has been able to do is put together a sound resource management plan uh, based on uh, very uh, detailed monitoring programs, marking hatchery fish and selectively harvesting those fish in, in uh, mixed stock fisheries, uh, carefully uh, finding places where we can fish, where hatchery fish are most abundant. And it takes a lot of uh, hard work and it's all, all, always a complicated uh, process to describe, but uh, one that seems pretty simple when people get out in the water and get their lines wet. If you want to see more salmon survive their trip past the dams on the Columbia River and you like to go fishing and would enjoy some extra cash, then the Department of Fish and Wildlife has a summer program just for you. Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery is funded by Bonneville Power as a requirement of the 1980 power planning uh, um, legislation and what it does is pays recreational anglers to go out and catch northern pike minnow, which were formerly known as northern squawfish, from the Columbia and Snake Rivers. Sign up at one of our check stations. You can find out where those are either on our web page or in our brochure. It's basically pikeminnow.org. And go to our check station, sign up, go fishing, bring your fish back to us that, that day, 
and we will issue you a pay voucher for the number of pike minnow you caught nine inches or bigger. As of May 31st, uh, Bonneville Power has upped the reward level to be at $5 for the first 100, $6 for 101 to 400, and $8 for everything over 401. We do have specially tagged fish that are worth $500 uh, if you catch those. And any given year, we have about 200 of those caught by anglers. They're, they're not difficult to catch. The hardest thing about them is to find the fish and find them consistently. They're, they're pretty aggressive. They are a predator. And if someone is a good angler, they, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but they can figure it out and could catch that 100 without too much trouble. This is one of the, I mean, where else, you know, in anywhere can you get paid to fish like this, you know, I mean, and do it just part time. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Four o'clock in the morning, I'll be hitting it up then go work at Les Schwab for nine hours and back to fishing again. Well, our reward fund is typically a million dollars this year with the increase that BPA put in. It's now $1.6 million. And typically we catch about 12% of the pike minnow population within our program area. And over, over, uh, over the last 13 seasons, that's reduced predation on juvenile salmonids by approximately 25%. We get a lot of folks that are uh, retired that come out and are able to supplement their income. We have kids that do this as kind of a summer job. We have families that go out, uh, take their kids, and are able to not only make lunch expenses, gas expenses, uh, but spend some good quality time together. Salmon that begin their lives in a hatchery have to survive predator birds. A lot of anti-bird schemes have been tried, but the birds soon figure them out. But we've learned that what they can't outsmart is another bigger, faster, and tougher bird. Fish are here for 60 days, roughly, uh, acclimating to the Columbia River and uh, before we release them. And uh, the seagulls would show up right as the first truck showed up. And within a week or 10 days, we would have over 1,000 seagulls. That's in addition to some uh, Caspian terns and other fish-eating birds that have uh, learned about Ringgold's Fall Chinook program. Uh, when the problem became really bad, we tried to do an estimate on what we were losing, and we thought we were probably losing out of a three and a half million Fall Chinook program, we might be losing up to a million fish in that 60 days. We knew we had to do something, and we can't shoot the birds, and uh, cracker shells alone, which is what we historically use, cracker shells and whistlers, uh, the seagulls in particular got very used to them real quick, and pretty soon they were ineffective. We got on the internet and started researching non-lethal bird hazing, and uh, we found a couple of companies that offer a bunch of new tools, and uh, we tried the, the falconer, and at the same time, we brought online uh, an audible uh, propane cannon. You can hear them going off in the background. They're basically on a timer, and they go off about two times a minute. Then we also purchased, uh, which you can hear in the background, a uh, speaker system tied to a tape player that just re plays a seagull in distress over and over again. In addition to that, we bought some, basically they're mylar balloons, but they have a reflective eye on both sides. We also have what we call the scary man. Uh, that's how he's marketed, and basically he's on a timer, and about once every five minutes he fills up with air, kind of pops up like a scarecrow, and he's got a siren that goes off at the same time. He's not very effective with the seagulls, but he's extremely effective with the herons. Wherever he is, the herons stay away from there. Any one of those methods by itself would be basically ineffective, but all of them together uh, are very effective. And the number one key ingredient is the falcon. And the contractor we use is Jim Bafke. Uh, his business is Fear the Falcon in Goldendale, Washington. And, uh, he basically flies his birds two or three times a day, and as soon as those birds go in the air, all the birds work in the pond pretty much get out of here. And in between flying birds, he's shooting cracker shells, he's driving around harassing the birds, he's moving these other tools we've purchased around and changing things up, and basically he is uh, 
a full-time harasser of these fish-eating birds that uh, used to like to come to Ringgold because it was free, easy pickings, and now they've determined it's too much work, and so they go find lunch somewhere else. Washington's wildlife has a new protected area in eastern Washington, thanks to recently acquired property in Asotan County. In the future, this land will also provide you with another wildlife viewing and hunting opportunity. This ranch that we're adding to the Soton Creek Wildlife Area is 8,500 acres, and it's strategically located. It's surrounded by already existing public land. It also has very critical fish and wildlife habitats, and this brings the total of the Soton Creek Wildlife Area to 22,000 acres, and we join the National Forest Service, which of course has many more. So it's a big block of public ownership in the upper Soton Creek drainage. Some of the habitats that Director Canings noted today that were very important and that, and that we will be managing and saving through this land acquisition is a lot of aquatic habitat for endangered spring chinook and steelhead, as well as bull trout. There's some very critical habitats in the 5.5 miles of George Creek and South Fork of Asotan Creek, as well as a significant amount of steppe grasslands. There's about 6,500 acres of high quality grasslands here that will be managed for all the species that, in, that are dependent on grasslands. There's a significant component of ungulates that use this property. Uh, it's very important to Rocky Mountain elk as well as mule deer and uh, timbered stringers provide a real mosaic of habitats that are important to, to ungulates. The vistas from up here at the ranch, the wildlife that are contained that travel on and across the ranch, it's a special place folks. We've been involved personally with the ranch for 30 plus years. You've all been either on or around the ranch for some period of time, and we're very, we feel very fortunate to be able to share it with everyone. Here's where to see Washington's wildlife during the next few weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching us, and please join us again.